Hey there fellow primates, I hope this video finds you well on this hot and sweltering Tuesday afternoon in London. I will uh, upload this on Friday the 20th of May. For a specific reason, I want to commemorate the uh, 20th anniversary of the death of this guy here, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, paleontologist and uh, professor at Harvard University. See, you see him here uh, sitting at his desk in the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. And Stephen Jay Gould, I think, is probably very familiar to most of my viewers, but in case you haven't heard of him, he was, uh, by any measure, uh, one of the most influential biologists, paleontologists of the second half of the 20th century. Not just for his ideas um, that were intended for a professional audience. Uh, he wrote many papers and quite a few books, but perhaps especially because of his popular science writing. He wrote more than 300 essays for Natural History magazine, uh, and many popular science books uh, on top of that as well, uh, most of which I've read. And his voice echoed loudly throughout uh, the popular and professional literatures. And I first bumped into him in 1992, uh, 30 years ago, when I saw this little book, Hands, Teeth and Horses, Toes, uh, a collection of his uh, essays in natural history in a bookshop in Utrecht. Now, at that point, I was a first-year undergraduate student in biology, and I was not uh, an avid reader up to that point. Yeah. I was never a, a nerd uh, or an intellectually inclined person in high school. All that started uh, when I started studying at university, and in no small measure due to the writings of Stephen Jay Gould. Because when you start reading his essays, you're, op you're basically introduced to this enormously diverse vista of ideas in biology, and paleontology, and evolutionary theory, and the history of science. It, and I pretty much got hooked immediately. I have many great memories uh, of curling up in the evening time with uh, one of his essay uh, collections or one of his uh, books like Wonderful Life on the Burgess Shale Fossils and, and reading them against the background of uh, uh, Paco de Lucia uh, strumming his guitar. In case you don't know, Paco de Lucia uh, is the late great flamenco player and I assure you that being able to read popular science while playing um, Paco Lucia in the background is an acquired ability because for most people, and I remember for myself it well, as well, it is nerve-wracking to try to concentrate against the background of a guy strumming strings with his big yellow thumbnail, but uh, I got to like it. Uh, I think it was the soundscape against which I managed to focus on reading. Anyway, many great memories of, of evenings uh, reading his mostly elegant prose, although later in his career, especially in his last book, uh, The Structure of Evolutionary Theory, his prose became obese, fat, uh, enormously long, paragraph-long sentences. But um, books like this, uh, earlier in his uh, popular science writing career, uh, are just examples of some of the best non-fiction essays you could, uh, you could read anywhere. So yes, he was an important formative influence for me. Uh, throughout my studies as an undergraduate and into my years uh, at graduate school. But then when he died in 2002, uh, I had learned enough about biology and evolutionary theory to be able to look freshly at some of his views and come to realize that I shouldn't always trust him. And of course, that's not a problem because science moves on and scientific disagreement is, of course, the oxygen of scientific progress. But there are a couple of instances that started to nag because I thought, uh, you know, there is something wrong in some of his views. Now, one of his hobby horses uh, was to point out that uh, one of the greatest hurdles against scientific understanding is not the lack of facts, is not uh, an uh, absence of empirical evidence, it is conceptual locks, uh, biases, unconscious biases in people's thinking about things uh, that lock them into not seeing the truth uh, and thinking a wrong, you know, uh, in, in the wrong kind of way. And, and one of his most, I guess, uh, often discussed examples of a conceptual lock uh, that he diagnosed was present in lay people uh, was to think about evolution as a straight line of progress from simple beginnings to uh, an end point. Uh, and that um, was something that he wrote against for decades, right up until, until his death in 2002. So, uh, if you look at this particular slides here, uh, you can see on the right-hand side the Dutch translation of Gould's book Ever Since Darwin, uh, 100 Jahr na Darwin. And you can see on the cover five primate figures sort of walking 
in one direction and culminating in modern man. And he was really pissed off. He said, a personally embarrassing illustration this is of our allegiance to the iconography of the March of Progress. My books are dedicated to debunking this picture of evolution, but I have no control over jacket design for foreign translations, because he thought evolution is not a straight line process, it is a phenomenon of ever diverging lineages uh, forming an evolutionary bush or an evolutionary tree. And the uh, biologist David Archibald, he wrote a book about the history of how people have drawn evolutionary trees. He called this Steve Gould's Bane. Now, Steve Gould uh, wrote about this a lot uh, in his, his writings. And in his uh, book, Bully for Brontosaurus, for instance, he wrote this. He said, bushes are the proper topology of evolution. Letters, straight line depictions of evolutionary change, are false abstractions made by running a steamroller over a labyrinthine pathway that hops from branch to branch through a phylogenetic bush. I cannot remember when I read this as a student uh, thinking, oh, there's something weird about this. I probably just went, yeah, yeah, no, evolution is branching. But if you write popular science for a lay audience and you write something like this, that evolution is labyrinthine and hops from branch to branch, that seems to me weird as a professional biologist. When I think about evolution hopping from branch to branch, I think about very specific processes. Uh, for instance, horizontal gene transfer, where very distantly related organisms in different parts of the tree of life exchange genetic information, horizontal gene transfer, uh, transfer uh, that is opposed to the vertical transmission of genetic information from ancestors to descendants. But that's not what Gould is talking about. He says, no, the linear depiction of evolution is an abstraction and a false one at that. Uh, we need to think about evolution as bushes. And there were two examples that he discussed the most in his voluminous writings, the evolution of horses and the evolution of ourselves. So in his book, Wonderful Life, about the uh, burger shell fossils from the Cambrian, he wrote, for instance, this. He said, we are virtually compelled to the stunning mistake of citing unsuccessful lineages as classic textbook cases of evolution. We do this because we try to extract a single line of advance from the true topology of copious branching. This misguided effort, we are inevitably drawn to bushes so near the brink of total annihilation that they retain only one surviving twig, for instance, Homo sapiens uh, or modern horses. Uh, and we then view this twig as the acme of upward achievement rather than the probable last gasp of a richer ancestry. And he called this phenomenon of misdepicting evolution as a linear pathway, life's little joke. But when you read this as a biologist, you go, what, what do you mean by a richer ancestry? If you look, for instance, at horses, yes, there were uh, more species of horses than there are now. Uh, but it doesn't mean that all those extinct horses were lineal ancestors of the modern horses. And the same is true for humans. At some points in human evolution, there were many, uh, there were several hominin species living concurrently at the same time, which is a, an amazingly cool realization. But they were side twigs. Uh, of the main lineage leading to us. That doesn't mean that that is a richer ancestry, it just means that deeper in time we had more relatives that are now extinct. But that's not how Kuhl thought about things. So if you go and look what Elsie said in Bully for Brontosaurus about uh, uh, the evolution of horses, he says, for instance, Herocoterium in the base of the trunk, as now known, and he considered Herocoterium to be the probable ancestor deep in evolutionary time of modern horses. He says, Herocoterium is the base of the trunk and Ecus is the surviving twig. We can therefore draw a pathway of connection from a common beginning to a long result. Nothing wrong with that. The lineage of modern horses is a twisted, a tortuous excursion from one branch to another, a path more devious than the road marked by Ariadne's threat from the Minotaur at the center to the edge of our culture's most famous labyrinth. <sighs> Most important, the path proceeds not by continuous transformation, by but by lateral stepping. Ke? What, what, what do you mean, Steve? But, 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 what, what do you mean by let, lateral stepping? Right. Uh, but George Gaylord Simpson, uh, the 20th century most forward, uh, one of the most foremost vertebrate paleontologists and mammal experts, uh, he said Simpson, who held a lifelong commitment to the predominant role of evolution by transformational change within populations, rather than by accumulation, and now 
I have overlapping slides. Oh no, that's not good. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, there we go. Rather than by accumulation across numerous events of discrete branching speciation, could not entirely let go of biases imposed by the metaphor of the leather. So what he's saying is yet uh, Simpson, he, uh, he knew that evolution was branching, but he still liked to think about evolution also proceeding along linear lineages. Well, but that, that's how evolution goes, right? Uh, the linear aspect of evolution is not in conflict, is not an alternative to the branching aspect of evolution. Linear lineages can diverge and then you simply have more linear lineages. Uh, but that's not how Kuhl thought about it, and not just in his popular writings. I'll give you one example from uh, a 1988 paper. This was actually his presidential address to the Paleontological Society, and this was published in uh, the Journal of Paleontology. And he says this, he says, professionals like Simpson, of course, recognize the bushiness of equid and hominid trees, of horses and human trees, but still view the lone survivors as end products of a coherent energetic sequence within the bush, being energesis being evolutionary transformation within unbranching lineages. But he presents them as if they were alternatives in conflict. He says macroevolution, evolution, uh, Macroevolution cannot be an extrapolation of anagenesis within populations. It must be conceptualized as the differential success of species. But uh, no, they're both. Because if you have differential success of species, uh, evolutionary trends, for instance, being produced by some types of species, with some types of characters going extinct and others surviving, those species are only different one from the other because of anagenetic change in populations. Otherwise, Lineage splitting just produces identical twins, then evolution uh, doesn't work. The macroevolutionary engine stops if microevolutionary change along unbroken lineages, unbranching lineages, doesn't happen. But he didn't see this. And in fact, this can be illustrated, this misunderstanding that there is some sort of conflict between the linear and the branching aspects of evolution from his very first papers in the 1970s to his culminating. A monograph, The Structure of Evolutionary Theory, that was published in 2002, the year he died. So just two last quotes. Uh, 1977 in Paleobiology, he celebrated the fifth anniversary of the punctuated equilibria theory, which he proposed together with his colleague at the American Museum, Niles Eldridge, um, in 1972. And in this celebratory paper, in the last sentence of the first paragraph of the abstract, they write this. They say, Evolutionary trends are not the product of slow directional transformations within lineages. They represent the differential success of certain species within a clade. But how can you have different species if you don't have slow directional transformation within lineages? Because then species speciation by branching, lineage splitting, just creates identical twins. I, I don't understand this. And then lastly, on page 846 of his book, The Structure of Evolutionary Theory, Gould writes this. For example, Protero and Shubin, uh, who studied horse evolution, have shown that the Oligocene transition from mesohippus to myohippus conforms to punctuated equilibrium, which stasis in all species of both lines transitions by rapid branching rather than phyletic transformation. But, but, but if you have rapid branching and no phylogenetic transformation within those lineages, you don't get different differences, you just get the same thing. You cannot have evolutionary change without evolution within lineages. All evolutionary change is energetic. Cladogenesis, the splitting of branches and lineages, just produces patterns based well, that multiply the lineages. Um, but he, he couldn't see that. And this was deeply puzzling to me, and I will speculate about this uh, in, in a moment, what I think the, the, explanation, the explanation could be. Um, well, I can actually just do this at this point. It's, that's a, as good a place as any. Um, this is also this year the 50th anniversary of the theory of punctuated equilibrium, which in its most bare bones statement says that evolutionary change along unbranching lineages is far less important than the evolutionary change that accumulates when lineage is split. In other words and 
that's that's for them the reason to think for now Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould to think that branching is where evolutionary change comes from. No, branching just multiplies lineages. The change are still the changes between species are still due to evolution in lineages, what they call phylogenetic transformation sorry, phyletic transformation or anagenesis. So but they wanted to build this macroevolutionary theory using punctuated equilibria as an engine of macroevolutionary change, where it's not about slow transformations in lineages, it's all about differential success of species, that they started to see where there wasn't any, a conflict between the linear and branching aspects of science. They wanted to build this independent macroevolutionary theory that was decoupled, the word they used and got from Stephen Stanley, from microevolution, evolution in unbroken population lineages. But you can't do that. Yes, you can have sorting through extinction, for instance, of species with different characteristics, but they are species that get these different characteristics through anagenetic genes in unbroken lineages. There's no other way that evolution happens. However, some people can't see this conceptual flaw, this conceptual lock. They think that life's little joke really is a problem, but it isn't. There is a straight line from the base of the tree of horses to the, the, la the the, the, the remaining twig and ecu. There is really a straight line from the origin of primates right up to us. Um, but paleoanthropologist Ian Tattersall, for instance, disagrees. You can see him here in his office in the American Museum of Natural History. It's one of my favorite images, photos of, a, of an author. Sits there. I, I imagine, you know, many people, when they think of a museum scientist, they think about something like this. A man with a little beard, glasses, perched on his nose like this sitting in what looks like a real wooden museum office with drawers, bones on the table. But if you look uh, carefully, just in front of the standing skeleton, there's also a glass of red wine, which makes it my favorite picture. But he said, I'm convinced that Steve's most seminal contribution to paleoanthropology was his insistence from very early on that as a consequence of its punctuational pattern, the quick appearance of descendants that look very different from their ancestors, the genealogy of human evolution took the form of a bush with many branches rather than a ladder. Yes, the tree as a whole looks like a bush, but when you want to understand the evolution of any taxon or trait, and there is no horizontal gene transfer, for instance, then they are just linear lineages through time. But he said, no, Gould's tireless advocacy of the idea that human phylogeny presents us with a bush rather than with a ladder introduced into paleoanthropological thought a powerful and compelling metaphor that continues to gather momentum. Australopithecus, as we know it, is not the ancestor of Homo, and that in any case, letters, evolution as a continuous sequence of ancestors and descendants, do not represent the path of evolution. Here he cites Gould. And this is such a revealing citation. What is evolutionary change if not a continuous sequence of ancestors and descendants? I, I can't see it. There is no conflict. There is no dichotomy between the linear descent of lineages and the splitting of those lineages to produce a branching bush. There isn't. And yet, Gould and Eldridge and Ein Tattersall uh, present in many of their writings, uh, also for popular audiences, including in some of his own popular science writing, uh, Ein Tattersall presents these views of the linear and branching aspects of evolution as being in conflict. They aren't. They can't be. But because, in the case of Gould and Eldridge, not shown a case of Tattersall, they wanted to develop a theory of macroevolutionary change, which the species with units of evolution and lower level population level processes uh, could basically be fortuitously ignored. Uh, they focused on the branching aspects of evolution to the complete ignorance of the linear aspect of evolution. And that is a huge conceptual lock that they had but didn't see. So, in conclusion, Tetzel writes, perhaps most importantly, Steve Styler's propagation of the bush versus ladder imagery influenced the perspective of an entire generation of paleoanthropologists, just as it did their brethren in other areas of evolutionary biology. Well, is this deserving of applause, or should we scratch our chins and go, oh my lord, this is actually uh, potentially problematic, because the linear and branching aspects of evolution, the ladder versus bush, is a false dichotomy. Uh, there is no conceptual problem here, but you seem to miss this. And as I argue in my own book in, 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 at some length, but you have to go and read it, I'll give you just one slide, um, the effect of this reverberates through the literature that is still current today. And one of the more worrying 
aspects of it. This is that you can see these views um, duplicated in literature intended for educational audiences. Just give you one slide uh, where these authors, Catley et al., discuss diagrams, evolutionary diagrams from textbooks for high schools and uh, introductory university courses. For instance, the left one where you can see some uh, hominid fossils on the internal branches of a phylogeny, implying that some were direct ancestors of later ones. And the same with horses. They say the authors argue that these kinds of diagrams in textbooks and popular press presented as depicting evolutionary relationships suggest an inappropriate anagenic, which anagenetic is a more frequently used word, conception of evolutionary history. Anagenesis is one species evolving directly into another. And I can see what's going on there, because now, evolution is one species evolving into another. The problem is, how do you, along an unbranching lineage, demarcate species? This is a very tough, maybe unsolvable epistemological problem. Um, but that doesn't mean that there is no linear descent of lineages, ancestors, and descendants. They make the debate muddled by thinking about lineage evolution in terms of species evolving into each other. You get a problem there, another nuisance factor that makes this whole debate muddled in the case of, of Gould's writing in particular is whether evolution has a basically a uniform rate, gradualism, or whether it can vary in rate a lot. And so you get a very misleading view of evolution here because surely some fossils could well be lineal ancestors of others. That's just the nature of evolutionary descent. We just have to be lucky enough to discover these preserved fossils and have good enough tools to recognize that they are indeed not relatives sitting on side branches, but direct ancestors. So the views of Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge, but, but Gould, I guess, is uh, more important. He has been writing about these topics uh, more voluminously and for many more decades. They have been very influential, but I would argue, and as I do in my book, that some of his views actually have not fertilized people's understanding, but really confused people's understanding of how we should think about evolution. Now, with 22 minutes in, I've been uh, ranting, it feels like, with, with some energy about this, but I care about this. Um, Gould is long dead, sadly. I wish that um, he could be here to, to debate these kinds of things, because even though I'm, I'm critical of him here, I think he... I like to imagine that he would have thought this is a good use of our time to read his works carefully, including his massive book, The Structure of Evolutionary Theory, and finding biases and conceptual slips uh, that he made, and I'm sure that he would admit that he would have made some, uh, and that you know are available for correction so we can increase our understanding and, and hone our conceptual uh, understanding of evolution. But his views are still widespread, widely cited in the educational literature, for example, right up to the present day. And I'm currently drafting a, a manuscript on this to show that the advice that he gave to his readers has been taken over uncritically by textbook writers, and they're now banishing depictions of evolution that are completely accurate and fine. It just depends uh, on thinking carefully about these things. So. I want to honor uh, Stephen Jay Gould's memory. Sorry, dude, that you've been dead for 20 years, and uh, I'm, you know, I could probably do a, a two-hour episode on just punctuated equilibrium theory, uh, trying to peel layers of it because I think there are some issues wrong with it. But I have the, high, the benefit of the hindsight. He published his paper with Niles Eldridge. Niles Eldridge was the first author of the first paper on punctuated equilibria 50 years ago, so I can't really. Uh, be too harsh on them. This is just the nature of scientific progress. The disagreement, as I said earlier, is the oxygen of scientific progress. Um, so I wish he was still here, but I feel that it's important to, um, uh, to critically assess the ideas from the older literature because they, their consequences reverberate in, in writing today. Okay, enough words, 24 minutes. It's, it's really hot. Uh, I've got two meetings coming up and my yearly appraisal before I go home. Then tomorrow morning I will jump on an airplane with my wife and we will fly to Faro in the Algarve in the, the south of Portugal. And then we take a taxi about 20 minutes west to a place called Olhoa to uh, celebrate 
the birthday of one of our friends, so that's what I'm going to do uh, for the rest of the week. I hope your week is going to be good. I hope you found this interesting. If so, like it under the video, subscribe to the channel, sign up for alerts. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.